So let's take a look at rational drug design targeted at tyrosine kinases. So we know that there's um, quite a lot of different tyrosine kinases in the cells. So we've got a range of targets. So the question is, is this a bane or a boon? Um, a bane meaning there's too many, it's a problem. And a boon meaning it's actually a good thing, you know. Right. So there's a range of um, druggable kinases in the cell. And some people might say there's an embarrassment of riches. So the, the downside of this is that if you target one particular kinase, you get non-specific interactions with another kinase. This might produce side effects. Okay, So we have this idea that kinase domains are evolutionary related to each other. So we've got these kinases domains that have been duplicated in the genome and then shared between these domains are shared between different proteins. So it might be difficult to target one kinase over another. Okay, So for argument's sake, there's, there's at least 90 encoded tyrosine kinase proteins in the human genome. So how do we target one or the other? So is it a boon or is it um, a bane to researchers. So um, looking on the left here we've got um, what we call the human genome. So it just means the tyrosine kinase, all of them grouped together, we call a genome. Okay? Like all the genes is called a genome. You know, there's lots of, you know, all the proteins is a proteome, so we love to put ohm on the ends of phrases, so all of the kinases is the genome. Right. So the types of kinases, kinases we have in cells, we have tyrosine kinases, we have the um, tyrosine-associated kinases or the tyrosine-like kinases, we have homologues of yeast kinases, we have casein kinases, so these are kinases that become active when they bind to casein, maybe. We have um, serine threonine kinases, we have calcium calmodulin dependent protein kinases, again protein kinase molecules that need to bind to calmodulin which is um, you know affected by calcium binding and there's a whole bunch of different kinases so we have these different classes of proteins that all have tyrosine kinase domains all right so they're involved in different pathways but they have domains which are tyrosine kinase domains and this sort of um, branched structure here just so shows the degrees of similarity between the tyrosine kinases being more similar to each other than, for instance, the you know, calmodulin-dependent kinases. But within the calmodulin-dependent kinases, they've got similarity. So it's just showing the sort of trying to graphically represent the similarity between the types of kinases. Okay, so modern day biology, data visualization is a very important thing to do, and this is a data visualization that tries to summarize um, the, the similarities between these enzymatic clefts. So I've been mentioning the idea of rational drug design as opposed to, you know, this serendipitous discovery. So rational drug design is that if you understand something, you can design a drug for it. So what you need to know, you need to know that the um, that the drug, it, that the, the target should be mis malfunctioning in the cell. So it needs to be an oncoprotein that's driving growth, and you want to knock it out. You need to know about its role. You also want to um, assess whether it's a druggable um, function that you can knock out, and ideally, you need to know the detailed molecular structure of the protein so that you can then design on the computer screen a drug that will fit like a lock and key into the catalytic cleft. So by way of an example, um, the inhibitor of the EGF receptor kinase um, is called Tarvacil and it fits snugly into the ATP binding cavity. So any kinase we know it needs to use as ATP and it it takes the phosphate group from ATP and phosphorylates acetylene, threonine, tyrosine, or whatever, based on, you know. So we know that 
kinases need to have these pockets for ATP. And when you look at the detailed three-dimensional structure of these kinases, you can then um, play around on the computer with different molecules and look for this lock and key fit that's going to um, put your drug into the catalytic cleft to knock out the kinase activity. So effectively you're displacing ATP. Um, again, here's a space filling model showing um, a kinase domain and it's got an ATP binding cavity which is shown here and then within that cavity here they've de designed Tarvacil which binds into that cavity and um, snugly knocks out the ability of this protein to phosphorylate other proteins. And this protein is going to be involved in driving growth and therefore the small molecule stops its ability to drive, to drive growth. Given that you can design something on a computer and you can do this assay for a drug on a bench, the challenge is, well, will this information translate into a preclinical research outcome that cures somebody? Okay, so, um, so we need to translate information from the laboratory branch into clinical research. So for argument's sake, another way of doing um, drug design is to use these high throughput screens. So, you know, if I'm a molecular biologist in a well-funded lab, I can write off to a chemical company and say, I want to buy, um, you know, X many thousand small um, drug molecules all assayed into plates and then to each of those plates I'm going to add my cells and look at the effect the drug that I've purchased has on the cell. So you can do these large scale screens quite effectively um, because there are companies that do a lot of the chemistry on a very large scale and they give you small amounts of many drugs and then you can see whether those drugs have an effect on your assay. Um, sometimes you find something that works in your assay but when you translate that from the bench to the clinic it turns out that the dose you'd have to use would be too high and it's just not possible to deliver such a large volume of drug from an inner patient even though you can do it at the laboratory bench. So there's lots of challenges with rational drug design and high throughput screening of an array of compounds. So, like I said, a lot of this rational drug design is focused on looking at tyrosine kinase inhibitors because tyrosine kinases play an important role in cell signaling. So, attempts at identifying all of the kinases that might be affected by one of these drugs is challenging. So, we have a whole bunch of kinases, we've got maybe 100 kinases in the cell got these drugs, we've got to work out how effective it is the drug at one kinase as opposed to knocking out another kinase. You don't want to knock out multiple pathways, you want to target your drug. So you want to try and minimize off-target effects, okay? And some of these effects may not have been picked up in the initial screens. Um, but, you know, we're, we're starting to appreciate these problems and work towards overcoming them. And this is just a nice graph that shows this. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six um, kinases being assayed here. And um, a drug has been designed, and to one of these targets, the intended target, the drug is effectively inhibiting 100% of that kinase's activity. So it's an effective drug to this kinase. But when you assay the same drug towards these other kinases, it's having an effect, but it's a much lower effect. So it may be tolerable to treat a patient with this or to treat the cancer with this and you knock out the main pathway, but you perturb other pathways to a small degree. So possibly it's got side effects, but if those side effects are outweighed by the beneficial effect of knocking out the major pathway, then that's a win. Okay, so this is just showing that Gleevec which I've shown you earlier, is targeted towards some kinases much more strongly than others. And therefore, it's, it's effective at knocking out particular pathways.
Now, during rational drug design, um, you tend to test the drugs on models before whole organisms. This might lead to problems where you have a molecule that's either hydrophobic or hydrophilic. It works in your assay, but the hydrophilic molecule may be poorly, poorly soluble and may not work in a whole organism. Or the hydrophilic molecule may be highly soluble, but not be able to get into the plasma membrane. So whenever you translate this bench work to whole organisms, there's a different set of criteria which you may not have taken into consideration that will affect the drug within the whole organism. Uh, another question, and um, it's an important question, is um, if you're doing studies in cell lines, you've got these cells that represent a cancer or a cell that represent this, will that research in the cell line correlate or translate to cell to, to, to the whole organism? So these cell lines are derived from tumors, which sounds good, but typically they're derived from the more aggressive tumors rather than the early stage tumors. That's just the nature of trying to make a cell line. They're easy to make from more aggressive tumors. And therefore, you know, it may be that it's not a good model for the early stage development of that tumor. And a lot of these cell lines have been cultured for a long time and that they, they, they may have progressed beyond the state at which they're found in the tumors. So within the lab, these cell lines may have proceeded beyond the normal realms of that, that, that is found in, in an organism. And I, I think um, I, I've done some of these experiments myself where I've used anti-cancer drugs or new anti-cancer drugs. I've done protein DNA assays and looking at whether these anti-cancer drugs bind to DNA and do all of this and we do assays in HeLa cells and when we send it off to get published we invariably get a comment saying well do HeLa cells actually represent what's going to happen in tumor patients or tumor cell lines so then have to go through a process of paper being re reviewing the paper and having a discussion with the reviewers to discuss whether the, the model we used was an adequate model for the tumor, and if there's another, another, alternative, and another alternative. So that's what this comment here is from the textbook, saying some cell lines may have deviated from the original tumor. And um, it's all good discussion, and um, there's just some of the, the caveats of laboratory research. This is just a nice little figure from the diagram saying that from these less aggressive tumors, it's very difficult to establish tumor, um, um, tissue culture cell lines because we do a lot of our experiments in tissue cultures. But from more, more aggressive tumors, it's been easier to establish cell lines. So it's whether this cell line is a model for this earlier stage of tumor. Okay, But some model is better than no model. The other problem is we have um, toxic side effects from drugs and we want to try and minimize those. So ideally, a cancer treatment should have a what's called a high therapeutic index. So it, it, it targets the cancer cells whilst leaving normal cells alone. And that is pretty much the, the, the holy grail of, of, of developing a cancer drug is one that specifically targets the, the, the cells that are out of control. And it's very difficult to do this because if you compare the cell biology of cancer cells to normal cells, then there's thousands of proteins present in both cell types. So some of those cell pathways are tweaked, some of them are mutated, but there's a lot of commonality between cancer cells and normal cells, and therefore it's, it's difficult to not affect normal cells with your drug that affects the cancer cells. Okay? Thank you.